everyone again to the Recursive Podcast, this time streaming straightly uh, from Bucharest for the first time. Our first guest today is an engineer by background and entrepreneur by necessity. He began his entrepreneurial journey because he felt that things in software development are mediocre. And he founded his first company called Qualitans. In the end, he was working already from, for companies from the Fortune 500s list and exciting startups from all over the world. A year and a half ago, he found his uh, second company, FlowX, the world's first platform for AI-assisted digital tr transformation. What that means, I'm going to ask him a bit later, but now please meet Iwan Jakob. Welcome to the Recursive Podcast. Well, thanks for the invitation, for sure. <laughs> Thank you for coming. It's great to be here. So, before we move to your startup experience, which now is currently, I think, very exciting, um, can we just go back a bit in time and um, can you tell me a bit more about your student years? Did you know that you're going to be an entrepreneur back then? No, I, I, had, no, I had no clue. And actually being, being an entrepreneur is, for me, it was and is still a bit of a mistake, so to speak, right? Like, it, no, it was completely accidental. When I started my first company, I had no clue what I was doing, like absolutely no clue. And I, I actually, I think that's super important um, because you, you have to be a bit of an idiot in order to be an entrepreneur, because if you actually know what you're going to go through, you're, you wouldn't start it. Right. So it's, it's always, it's kind of like, um, <clears throat> you know, birth and oxytocin. Right, like you, you tend to forget all the pain that you've been through, and then you're like, "Oh, let me do that again." So, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit like that. <laughs> I like this kind of association. I think our brain is basically wired to forget the pain. It's not only with women and birth. I think we're generally built like that. No, I think smart people, yeah. you know, remember. Yeah. <laughs> but dumber people like like I am don't. So they're like, "Oh, let me start another company again. That'll gonna be fun." So. But I think even back then you were kind of, you know, really smart of, uh, you know, how to make money. Uh, I don't know about that. I, I wasn't, uh, yeah, I, I was just uh, an engineer uh, working for, uh, uh, you know, larger companies and also uh, US startups. Um, I think I, <clears throat> so I moved uh, from, uh, from being, uh, you know, an engineer actually pretty early on and kind of moved into management. but. You know, I was still uh, deep inside, secretly an engineer, and I like to, to believe that I still am to this day, even though I, I definitely don't qualify anymore. So I, I couldn't pass a, a, an interview test from from Sherban, who's our CTO. Like he, the guy would just throw me out after the first five minutes. Mm -hmm. It's not that that's what we do with with people that don't pass our interviews. We don't throw them out, which is very nice. We give them coffee and, and all that. So. Yeah, I was actually just referring to your ping pong story. I find it actually kind of, you know, very American style. You know, you weren't selling really lemonade, you were selling ping pong balls. <laughs> How did you come up with that? Well, it's just, but you see that, I think that's, that's one of the interesting things about startups, right? Because everybody assumes there's recipes. And I, I think there is some part that's, that's a bit of a recipe, like, and that recipe is more around don't be an idiot. Um, but then it's a lot about like finding like this narrow niche of, of opportunities, mm -hmm. right? That, that show up that you, when, when you come across them, right? Cause, <clears throat> and the ping pong story, but I, I, by the way, I had no idea that that's, that's a thing, right? <laughs> I, I said that in an interview, like 10 years ago and now it just haunts me. Um, <laughs> Sorry, but, I'm yeah, probably no. making you tell the story for the hundredth time, but uh, yeah. No, that, that's all right. Um, but it, it was the same, like there was a need there and I was like, okay, that's the, you know, let's, let's, and it's all, it's always about that, right? It's, it's about finding a need and seeing, you know, an opportunity to create value for other people and then trying to capture a, a part of that value. I think that's that's the, the you know the most important equation, right? Mm. And I think a, a lot of time, like people essentially forget about the, that equation, right? Mm. Super uh, centric and super uh, me focused and like me 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 all, all the way around. But it's not about you. It's never about you. It's about other people. And it's about creating value for other people. And then you know being fair in in capturing like a a, a small percentage of that value or a larger percentage depends. But you know. 
<clears throat> yeah, I think recognizing opportunities and believing you know, maybe a bit of the delusional way that uh, you can provide value and in these niches is uh, something that makes an entrepreneur. Um, but you are saying that your heart is of an engineer. So later on, you went a bit deeper into math and you became a software engineer. Yeah. And somehow you developed a very high expectation of how programs should work, how software should be built. How did it come to that, that uh, your idea of quality was different? Well, it's <clears throat> it was very much about observing things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and having having that math background, which kind of gives you a, a, a weird bias, right? Like this quant bias, you believe that everything in the world can be quantified. So you kind of tend to look at the world through through that through that lens, which is wrong, by the way, like because it, it discounts human emotion. And actually human emotion is much more important than, than quant a lot of the times. But anyway, and <clears throat> so being an engineer at, you know, a, a, a US based a Silicon Valley startup, you know, before it was cool to be uh, to work for a startup, everybody would ask you like, what the hell are you doing working like work for a serious company? God damn it. Um, and then, you know, working for a serious company, right? And then another serious company. And, and I noticed this this interesting pattern, which is if you look at the code being written right in a, in a project or building a product in in a good team, more than 80% of that code is just rework, mm. right? So about 15% of the code is just taking the product forward. And that's insane, right? If you think about it. Sure. So uh, I, um, th th that's what I saw. And I constantly, consistently saw that. And that was in the good projects. Like I, I repeat that, like that was for good teams, like worse teams. That was like terrible. It was 5%, 95%, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> I, I saw those numbers and I consistently see, saw them over time and in different companies, different teams, different environments. I was like, huh, that's that's interesting, right? And th there's there's an opportunity there to build software in a very different way. And um, I had no idea actually. Well, I had an idea, but it was wrong uh, about how to solve this. And that's how I started Qualitans. But it was like, ah, oh, let me start a company and solve this because if you know, if I can capture ten percent of, 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 you know, if I can increase that with with ten percent, that's almost doubling the, you know, the velocity or the efficiency. So um, that's how how Qualitans started. But uh, actually, the first idea that we had about it was wrong, because we believe that it could be done through, you know, this um, matrix of, of um, uh, technology and processes and procedures. And it, it's it's not right. And then we met Tom Chi, who's one of the co-founders of Google X. Uh, and um, who, we, we've had a couple of very interesting discussions in uh, in San Francisco with Tom, and then he decided to join and, and help with uh, building what we were trying to build. Wow. Right? A, a company to do a, a different way of, of approaching software. And in the end, it was <clears throat> more about looking at the overall product design, right? We, we realized that writing bad code actually starts way, way before um, starting to write code mm. it's uh, writing bad code starting started from designing the wrong or thinking about the wrong product mm. right and about about the wrong features and about the wrong users and about so um, <clears throat> this is what qualitans became right it became like this interesting kind of end-to-end -end, uh digital uh solution that would you know create design the right product and then build it in in technology and I can guess back then you didn't have a lot of competition here in Romania because most of the companies that were providing software development were <clears throat> like an outsourcing companies, right? Yeah, we, we actually, there was, uh, our market was not Romania at all. Oh. Like we weren't, we were barely working for the Romanian market. We were just working for, uh, uh, you know, mostly U.S. market. Speaking mostly about, you know, other providers of, uh, yeah. of software, so in a way competitors, like, yeah, no, but yeah. we we were pre and I still think to this day Qualitans in in that frame is is a pretty unique uh, company, mm. right? I think it's one of the very few companies that brings together product design, mm. right, and and product strategy and design and and technology. 
I want to, you know, tap a bit more into that because I had another conversation with um, um, uh, the product guy from Product Hunt, and yeah. we were speaking about, you know, the difference of between being a good engineer and being a good product person. So you learned how to be a good engineer and then you ventured out with qualitons and then you had to learn how to be a good product designer or a product manager, I guess. What would you say is, you know, the difference in the mindset or in the thinking? It's, it's all about um, being able to listen, right? Because um, what, what we discovered, and this was, this was one of the most fascinating things, and I think this comes from Tom Chi's kind of rapid prototyping mindset and um, there there's he has this uh, this video on TED that it's a it's an eight minute thing and I highly recommend anyone to, to see that I, I, I feel that's one of the most exciting things I, I've discovered in the early lives of, of qual in the we'll early provide, we uh, will provide the link somewhere in the podcast yeah no that, that would be mm -hmm. fantastic and <clears throat> uh, it, it's this um, this idea that you know you can think about a product and then build a product and put it in front of the users and users will be like, wow, this is great. That's so wrong, right? Good products don't come from good product designers. What good product designers do is actually they listen to users. Like they put stuff in, they build things really fast. They put things in front of users, they get input, but they, they, you know, they don't discard input. They actually take the input because there's all this, there's this entire bias right to to build something put it in front of users and then users don't get it and they're like yeah these are stupid people that they're not they're not getting it well no you're 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 the stupid one right for not listening to them mm. so i think building a good product is is about listening but you know not not cuz there's there's nuances to listening right there's the listening to reply right it's when you listen to someone and just waiting to kind of catch that moment where you can say what you want to say or where you can contradict them or just you know uh, and then there's listening you know to actually and processing what the other person is saying and and that's super super important like building products building teams doing whatever you know in a successful manner in life it's super important to kind of listen to people and process what they're saying and thinking how could they be right? Really, that's one of the interesting tricks that I've, I've, I've learned. Um, <clears throat> and, and you have to really listen what people, to what people are saying and think like, how could they be right? Like from what angle could they see this that it's right? Right. And then, yeah, because there's very few people actually, and I haven't met any that are really bad intended, that they're just, uh, you know, intentionally, uh, you know, manipulating uh, or trying to manipulate you. People are just giving you some, most of the time, their honest opinion. And it's super interesting to understand how could they be right? Like, what are they seeing that I'm not seeing, you know, that, that they could be right about? I get it. I'm thinking now that maybe sometimes what makes it hard for us, you know, to listen to other people's um, feedback and opinion is our own ego. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, it's the thing that we don't want to be wrong. We yeah. really have like a difficulty, you know, processing this internally, especially when you're still yeah. not confident enough, which is most of the cases, you know. With, uh, uh, absolutely. And then when you realize that it yeah, comes founders. to a simple choice, like, do you want to uh, satisfy your ego or do you want to be successful in a different way? And it's, you know, once you remind yourself that, yeah, no, I, I, I don't really care about my or I don't want to care about my ego, you can you can consciously step over that. But un unconsciously, there's there's a ton of. Mm. Uh, uh, would you know. say <clears throat> that a good product manager would also need a certain empathy, like uh, being able to put himself in the situation of these users and exactly understand from their point of view how they feel about a product or a solution? Yeah, I, I think empathy is much more about emotion and, and yeah. you know, it's not a quant thing for me. Okay. So, but actually listening to people and then thinking through what they say. I'm not saying that you should say to everyone, you're right, you're right, you're right. But that's, that's not the case, but you should at least understand why they're saying that. Mm. Like, like why, are, why, why are they saying that? 
Mm-hmm. Right? And most of the time, people just say, yeah, he's saying that because he's bad intended. And it's so easy to kind of write off feedback or he's saying that because he's an idiot. He's saying that right? it's so easy to kind of reject feedback and, and get it, you know, not dismiss it. And it's, it's a lost learning opportunity. Mm. I know this from experience, you know, sometimes I'm dreaming that I was working for a company that was doing something really complex like space tech or whatever, so that um, I don't get so much feedback on all the things that we should do differently or we should, uh, we're kind of, you know, doing wrong because it's, it's so difficult sometimes for my own confidence, you know, to deal with all that. But when you're doing it, but, media, but everyone even, knows how to do it better than you. <laughs> but even in, you know, there's this: the opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one, uh, right? So um, th- I love this expression. By the way, I use it quite often myself. Okay, right. <laughs> and I think, especially in our region in Southeast Europe, we're very opinion opinionated people. <laughs> yeah, and we, you know, we we have this entrenched idea about being right. You know, so what's right? Like, th- this is not right. Like, who the fuck are you to decide what's right? Like, since when are you the holder of, you know, the ultimate truth and, and justice? Like, and, and this is why I, I always ask myself why UiPath and, and Dina's cho- chose, you know, uh, I, I think humble as one of their mm. values. And I think I understand and understood later that's why, right? Because you actually have to kind of step back on, on your own ego and kind of think through like what is what are these people saying like you know why should i be right why should i have the the the... it's very interesting here in the podcast we happen to talk uh, quite often about ego and uh, when you build a company in a way you have to be very competitive and i was always you know kind of associating competitiveness with uh, with ego which is in contradiction to what we're saying now. I mean, how do, can you build like good products if you can't step out of your own ego and start listening to others? Yeah. And how can you be a good entrepreneur and a leader in a company if you cannot step out of your own ego and be there for your uh, organization and your colleagues? How do you see that? I mean, um, where is, is it a balance or is it something which is not binary? I mean, you being a math person i I think ego or or, you know prioritizing your ego is always a bad idea right like you you should definitely take input and just think through it and then some things make sense and some things you want to do and and again it's it's all about decisions of what's most important for you right because you can you can say well some people choose emotion over uh money and you know that that's absolutely right like there's definitely a ton of the things like that's actually our primary driver emotion right we we do most of the things for emotion and uh, <laughs> right it's not we're, we're at the end of the day we're going to spend money to to live emotion this is why people buy BMWs and but we're and doing Ferraris, really right? but we're doing really great thing convincing ourselves that we are taking rational decisions no yeah yeah i, I know we we have this this a uh, belief that now we're, we're, you know, rational people and we're not, we're, we're actually not, right? So, but it's just about making that a very conscious decision, right? Like right now, I want to choose this over satisfying my emotion. And right now, you know what? I'm just going to fuck it all up because I, I have this emotion and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm accepting that, right? It's just, it's just an, an equation sure. at the end of the day. And it's, but you, you just have to be uh, you know, conscious of it. That That's my only point. Like, wh- whatever you choose is your choice and you're free to choose whatever. But ju- just be just be aware of it. Because then you start, you know, w- what I'm seeing is then, uh, you know, people are choosing their emotion over success and then they're starting to blame, you know, society, the world, the patriarchy, the, you know, all these things, um, you know, other people for, for their lack of success, right? And it's it's not come on it's, okay. it's it's really like the way i see it is obviously life is not fair and i think one one of the biggest uh delusions that we have is that life should be fair no life isn't fair and can't be fair right that i, I I'm, I'm sorry i, I mean you're I current, you know you're like things. destroying my illusions right now yeah no i i, I don't think like, like we all are all born 
you know, with, you know, some, some people are born taller, some people are born short, some people are born beautiful, some people are born uglier, some people are born smarter, some people are born um, less smart, some people are born more stubborn. There's like all this mix. And just imagine the world where everyone would look the same and think that the same and be, it's fucking terrifying. Wow, the same is not... Uh, no, no, like if, if we So the same be, is not the same as fair. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, but you know, but that, <laughs> mm. that would be fair because everybody would get the same chances. But is that even uh, an interesting world? Uh, so, right? If, if there is a difference between equality and equity. Uh, so, you know, getting the same chances is different than we all being the same. Wonder what does getting the same chances mean? Right? If I'm blonde and you're brunette, <clears throat> are we getting the same chances? Probably not. They think blonde okay. is always better. <laughs> okay. So we should all be blonde. If I'm blue-eyed and you're brown-eyed. Just joking. Right? No. But, yeah. but you see my point, right? Yeah. Like if you want to, if we want to shoot for in that direction, there's no, there's no stopping. Like the, the limiting case is where everybody looks the same, thinks the same. It's just like exactly the same and is moving. That's not an interesting place to live by I, my definition. I right? get your point. Like yeah. the, the interesting thing in life for me has been just overcoming shit. I, I, th that's, that's what I drive satisfaction out of, actually. It's overcoming really complex problems together with a bunch of really smart and good people. That's what drives me. That's, that's where, I, where, I, where, I, what, 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 where I get satisfaction from. Mm. Right? So, um, yeah. So, I think this direction we, has gone in a bit of a different it's, way. It's, it's totally and, okay, but I was now thinking because I would like to connect that. And you said that there, you know, a lot of people who choose emotion and not success in their life, and then they complain that life is not fair. So, how does it look like? What are the consequences of really choosing success? As well, you, it depends. As you it, it depends what you define by success, right? If you, if what you, is your idea? Um, if you, so again, if, if you define success as, you know, having your ego satisfied, then by all means, just go ahead. Right. Um, but, uh, for, for me, success is about creating value in the world, right? Like really contributing to, to the world with, with something. Now, this is why I believe, for example, that, you know, Elon Musk is, is a successful guy. It's because he's contributing to human civilization. He's taking forward. He's like really impacting the forward movement of human civilization. I, I think that's, that's the, for me, that's, that's my own definition of success. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone has their own definition of success. And I don't think we should be prescriptive about, uh, do you feel like, um, but you, it's just like, mm -hmm. you have to be sorry to interrupt, but you have to be just very at peace with your definition of success and very conscious of it. Like, this is my definition of success. And yeah, this is what I'm choosing. And then and you then have to do like the consequent uh, actions yeah. to that. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, do you feel like you are reaching this goal with qualitons? Um, do you feel like you're contributing to? Yeah, I, I did feel. I, I think qualitons did some insanely amazing projects in in the tech space, right? Things that were absolutely breakthrough from, from many, many points of view. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think it was, uh, it, it was, uh, very, very interesting from that point of view. Yeah. Because if, you know, in a way I get the sense that the definition of success, uh, for you is not, you know, being among the top thousand, you know, companies in software development named by financial times or rankings like that. I think, um, I mean, what I'm sensing here is a different, uh, idea of value creation <clears throat> and innovation and uh, being successful in this way. Yeah, which... yeah no, for, for me, it's, it's, it's about the, really about the impact that you can make mm -hmm. on, on, you know, other people's lives in, in a good way, of course. So you're working actually mostly with the enterprise um, type of companies, which can be sometimes very slow, I guess, uh, and you're working with them on sure. digital transformation, which is always a huge topic in every large corporation that we mm -hmm. see. Um, what do you really do for them? How so, do you help solve, you know, certain 
challenges that they're facing. So I think one of the biggest problems in, in the, in the uh, enterprise world, in the large enterprise world, is legacy systems. And you have to look at that from, from a historical point of view, right? So we started with you know, building computers and building software way before we, uh, we got to this point where, that we've been at in the past you know, just a couple of years, really, if you think about it, where everyone has like a mega computer in their pocket or on their wrist. Mm. Right. And um, uh, it was just a very, very different scene back then. So I'm, I'm looking now at all these companies and they're completely encumbered by their legacy stack deck. Right. And they're just stuck there. And it, it's almost like this deathly trap that's keeping them because they've invested so much in that. And it's so big and so complex and it's really hard to extend like every step to grow that is just a massive pain uh and but that legacy stack uh you know doesn't really support uh digital by today's standards it's 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 barely scalable if at all reliability isn't there users are so fucking unhappy about it right and then it's just fragmented it's it's pure nightmare it's literally these companies are being run by their legacy stack and if you look at the numbers right like they spend all this money just pour all this money in, into their legacy stacks right and c being completely trapped by by that right mm -hmm. there's very little resources that remain to actually move things forward and then moving things forward typically means extending the death trap and just give feeding the beast you know sure. uh so uh, <coughs> with with FlowX, uh, we're we're breaking that cycle, right? We're we're giving these companies a way out. We're giving we're helping these companies build fast in digital and and kind of you know get not not necessarily get rid ultimately sure get rid but the 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 most important thing is there we we give them the freedom to build fast and build you know by today's uh, digital standards. Hmm. This is actually a really huge challenge. I mean, I've been working myself in this kind of sector and I know how difficult it is for um, enterprises, you know, to get out of this legacy system trap that you're speaking yeah. about. Um, and I know that, you know, companies who kind of, you know, help them go both ways, like keep their legacy system, exactly. but yeah. at the same time modernize their uh, to something which is, you know, more um, customer centric can be very successful and you know can also make a lot of a lot of money on that because this is like one of the biggest challenges that we're having right now yeah I, I, I honestly believe it's and you know it comes out of collisions because and you know this is the problem that we've been seeing it's the same pattern that we've been seeing in qualitons over and over and over again yeah. right it, it's these companies just being completely stuck from and and prevented from building amazing things, right? Because you look at these huge companies are like, why the hell aren't they able to build like simple, beautiful things? And it, this, you know, that that's the reason. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly, yeah, it's the core revival kind of uh, trend that, that we're enabling and we're helping them get, get uh, on top of that. So being able to provide digital, uh, you know, modern, beautiful experiences for people, unified experiences for users and for employees, but without having to change their their uh, their legacy stack, right? So kind of giving that a, a new life. I think uh, <clears throat> you know having or uh, working on greenfield project has become more and more of a luxury nowadays when you're you know working yeah. for for other companies. Um, I want to go a bit into exactly this transition for you personally from Qualitons to FlowX. So I guess you know the success of Qualitons wasn't enough for you, so you had to. Um, you know, venture out with a second company. And I think this there is a very interesting moment and uh, experience that you can share. How do you build an organization to a level where you can step out as a CEO because you were the CEO of Qualitons yeah. and then become a CEO of a startup where, of course, I guess, you know, your focus is really necessary especially now in the beginning. 
how do you make the transition and how is your organization Qualitans right now? How many employees do you have? Like 200? Almost 200, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, it depends. You can even oh. say 300. How do they get used to the fact that you're not the CEO anymore? <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's again, it's about the, the ego equation, right? Okay. Right. You, you can be like, oh, you know, my ego is satisfied being, you know, CEO over 300 people. So I'm going to stay here. Or you can be like, holy shit, there's all this value that could be created, uh, right? So I don't care about, uh, you know, uh, that, that ego, and, but I'm just going to go for the value creation. Mm. And, you know, the, but the moment you, you realize the, the size of the opportunity in this, like, if we look at, you know, the large digital transformation projects that failed, and, you know, one of them is affordable, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Obamacare, yes. right? uh, $2.2 billion, right? And you can see it's the same pattern everywhere. It's like legacy systems and then being able to build something that unifies those legacy systems into a single, beautiful, scalable experience that actually works, right? That's, that's the challenge, right? $2.2 billion. A single project is $2.2 billion and still didn't really quite quite solve the problem right and then you you can go and look at nhs nhs spent 10 point something i don't remember exactly but anyway more than 10 billion pounds to do the same thing for their healthcare systems and failed right so that's a single project that that single project is a larger total addressable market than than you know a, a ton of startups have True. Right. So one project in that space is 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 worth that much. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a huge opportunity to to address there. Right. And I think this is something that that's that drives us. And I remember because I, I was in London, right? We we built FlowX inside Qualitans. And and it wasn't even called FlowX at the time. We just used it because we saw a problem and we wanted to build a solution. We didn't set out to build a company or build a product or build a startup or, you know, and this is why I, um, you know, I'm branching off here widely, but Do that uh, uh, I, I really have a problem with this kind of entrepreneur for the sake of being an entrepreneur kind of thing, right? Like, I, I believe there is, I'm, I'm an accidental entrepreneur because I stumbled across, you know, problems and then I, I stumbled across solutions and I just want to take those solutions to the market, right? And it's, it's no different from the, well, it's a bit different, but not, not conceptually different, you know, from the ping pong story, right? Like there was this problem, people were playing ping pong at the school, but didn't, didn't have balls for, for ping pong. And then I was going to the school every day and I was just passing this store that had ping pong balls and like you make a connection. It's not right. So, but it's the same thing. Like we, we started solving this problem inside Qualitans and then we created this, this platform. And, um, uh, you know, then I realized, well, this is a huge problem, right? And, well, we can, we can solve it. And by the way, we need to spend this out because it, it would never work out of a services company. It has to be a product mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the aha moment came for me was in, a, uh, I remember it was 2019 and we had opened our London office for, for Qualtons. And I was in London, I was uh, talking to the guys at Revolut. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I realized, and you know, they were telling me about Revolut. We're obviously trying to kind of sell them and, and do a project with Qualitans. And um, I understood that Revolut is actually, uh, you know, kind of a, a front end that sits on top of Barclays core banking and all that. And I can't remember anything else from that conversation because I was like, holy shit, like we have an engine for building Revoluts, mm. right? Like, and then just like in my mind, I started thinking about like, we have to spin this out. We have to go, we have to make this like a, a standalone company. Otherwise it, it can't succeed. And I, I started kind of playing out in my head and I can't remember anything else out of that conversation. But then two months later, I had already started the transition to Mike out, out of Qualitans to come out of Qualitans and take, take this, this on. And obviously, you know, it's, it's a very different risk return. Uh, uh, you know, value proposition, 
Right. Like completely different, right? It's it's just a huge risk. It's, it's much harder than 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 what what Qualitans is doing. But at the end, you know. Still, I find this phenomenon very interesting that <coughs> entrepreneurs who actually started the entrepreneurial journey in a service field, uh, in a service company, are sometimes better equipped to productize and to launch a startup than first-time entrepreneurs who go straight to, you know, launching a product company. I think, you know, this kind of sense that you're getting about the industries, uh, about the market, about the customers, about the users, when you're working for a service company is uh, super, you know, necessary to make a good product at some point. That, that, that might be. But, uh, that being said, again, I'm, I'm not a VC, so I, I can't I can't say that I have like a good understanding of the spectrum. But what I'm seeing is actually a, a ton of companies that are started by kind of first time entrepreneurs and they're, they're being super successful. So probably I think what you're saying makes sense. I, I'm not sure. It, it's definitely not a rule. Right. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. And for me, Qualitans was uh, I, I definitely made all the possible mistakes that I could have made in, in, in Qualitans. Um, and yeah, I, it's definitely, a, it's been a, a very, very, uh, interesting and exciting ride. And I, I yeah, tell me, company. I mean, what did you learn in Qualitons that makes you now a better second time founder? A everything. <laughs> okay. no, listen, you have to realize like we started Qualitons and l let me tell you how much we understood about business when we started Qualitons, right? We made a website. And we're like, yeah, we do this thing. And then we put our phones there and then we were just sitting and waiting for people to, to ring us up. And you were like, why the fuck aren't, aren't customers just, you know, barging in? It's like, oh, this is, this is terrible. What, what's going on here? <laughs> like, that's where we started, right? That, that's the level of, of, you know, business culture that, that we had when we started. Qualitas, right? And I think especially in Eastern Europe, you're not very strong in, in business uh, uh, mindset, like, you know, uh, managerial skills and uh, no, marketing and sales mar marketing, and business development. Yeah, yeah marketing. Yeah. I think marketing was, was a very, because, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, because, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, luck uh, having kind of a, a bit of an entrepreneurial family, right? Like my grandfather, when he was, uh, I think 60, 60 something, uh, like literally in January, 1990, after the revolution, February, 1990, he started uh, a company, right? He uh, started like, and it, it wasn't like a, a big company, it was this thing in the um, railway station that was selling uh, uh, some, some pies that my grandmother would make at home. Right? Oh, that was the so thing. Cool. And then that thing kind of grew over time and became like a business and it still employs like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 people to this date. Right. So I kind I, I, I saw that and I, yeah, I definitely had the belief that you can build something and you can, you know, actually capture value and then create value for people and capture value. But they just had no idea about this, you know, about digital marketing, about marketing yourself. Right. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a long way that we've come and, you know, probably the toughest lessons that I've learned were, were around leadership and, 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 you know, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I've made a lot of mistakes. Tell me about leadership. What makes a good leader? Uh, I think not having an ego makes a good leader, first of all. Um, and, uh, I, I think. You know, it's it's very much about enabling people. It's about enabling other people, mm. right? It's not about uh, it's not that image of leading other people. It's like I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna move the sword out, and yeah, right. Yeah, I think it's very much about enabling other people, mm. right? And and how how do you do that? And you know, um, and one of the co-founders of Flowex is is a VC and has. Um, uh, started his own uh, uh, venture fund in biotech and medtech, has a ton of experience in that, in, in the Bay Area. And he has this medical advisory board where he has like 
some of the top people in, in the US in, in the medical industry. One of these guys is this um, um, a professor uh, in um, uh, neuroscience and um, very interesting experiment. I'm going to try to cut it very short. Uh, one of the interesting things that he noticed was that, you know, stress actually, you know, has this has these two hormones, right? It's uh, uh, noradrenaline, norepinephrine and uh, cortisol. Mm -hmm. And um, in the presence of those hormones, actually, our immune systems is functioning better and our ne neocortex is actually functioning better. Mm. Right. So we're healthier under stress and we're smarter under stress, essentially. However, there's a threshold like a, a quit threshold where then when, when these two uh, go go above that, uh, the, your body's like, oh, fuck that, you know, I'm going to shut it down. So come there, there's this quit mechanism that, that comes in, right, and kind of terminates whatever you're doing. And this, this applies, you know, on, on short things like on, uh, you know, when you're running a marathon and you're not prepared and then your legs kind of just like, yeah, no, fuck this, I'm, 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 I'm out, right? But your muscles are still there. It's just no matter how much willpower you have, you're not going to be able to 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 move your your muscles, right? But then also in the long term, and it's the burnout. But then there's this interesting thing that he noticed, which is whenever dopamine comes into the equation, these stress hormones are kind of kept on a on a on a reasonable level, right? Mm -hmm. So they're they're still present, but they're not, they don't go above the the quit threshold. And dopamine that's associated with you know a sense of progress or a sense of, you know, making like a significant achievement, right? So I, I believe that, you know, we're actually as a society, we're treating stress in a very, very wrong way. We're looking at stress as being all negative. And I don't think stress is all negative. I, I think I actually think stress is the only thing that moves us forward, right? Because actually the, the sensation of hunger or thirst, that's actually a stress sensation. Right. So w without that, we would be like, yeah, fuck this. Let me let me just sit over here. Actually, so, <clears throat> for the body, from what I know, you know, excitement and stress pretty much feel the same way. Right. Yeah. So, OK, but do you have some life hacks that you're using, like biohacks? You know, how do you put not, not, yourself not, into not a so healthy much. stress mode? No, not so much, but it's 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 about mindset, right? And it's about mm. being conscious. And you know, we're talking about dopamine. So the, the big question is how do you create those dopamine sprays? Mm. Right. And it's it's always about am I going in a direction that's meaningful for me? Right? And am I making progress into 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 that direction? How do you get a this kind of feeling that you're progressing, that you're doing something meaningful? I, I'm, I'm asking this also from my personal well, so it's, it's, gain. It's, it's about yeah. the end goal. Like, where am I going? And you have to be very explicit about what you're trying to achieve. Okay. Right. And by the way, and you have to help your team kind of visualize, like, this is where we're going. Right. And some people will be okay with that. And then they, they will resonate. And some people will be like, yeah, fuck that. I, I don't care about that direction. And they're going to go away, which is what they should do. Right. Because it's not something that's meaningful for them. Yeah. Right? But then you have a team that's all very united under, you know, the same kind of direction and going after the same goal. So that's super, super important. And then it's about, you know, moving towards <coughs> it's about moving towards that that goal. Right. And um, being very explicit about the progress that you've made because it's very easy to forget that you're moving because you're still far away from the goal. I feel like that all the time. Like, you know, I, do, I never really see the progress that we've made. Like for instance, exactly. since we found it yeah. very recursive. I always feel like I have so much catching up to do. I'm running over, you know, yeah. the, uh, my backlog is like that. I'm never yeah. satisfied with how fast I do my tasks. It's so frustrating. Yeah. And we don't really have these tools, you know, to look at how yeah, far and, we and, actually and for, got. For, for me and, and for, for the, the team at FlowX, it, it just comes down to a very simple ex exercise, which is being reflective of, hey, what have we accomplished in the past period? And we do this kind of weekly, biweekly, right? Like, what have we accomplished that's actually meaningful and driving the company forward? And what do we shoot for in the next period that's meaningful and you know, is taking mm. the company forward. And then some of the things you will check and cross off that list, some of the things you won't, but you will have, you will get that dopamine, 
right? Because you're saying, oh, we're, we're making progress. And it's all about making progress, just moving forward, mm. right? Like even an inch, if you, if you see that you moved an inch, well, that's good, mm. right? It's, there's this um, interesting article by, uh, I think, Joel Spolsky. Uh, it's called Fire in Motion. I, I would highly recommend that. It's, just, it, it's essentially this, this kind of mechanism, right? But it's then, it's also about bringing everyone together and about, you know, guys like this is where we're going and we all know that that's something that we love and that's meaningful for us and here's the progress that we've made and we've made so much progress and you're right we we tend to be very dismissive right of the of the progress that we've made and being like ah oh, like so I would just want to go in that direction oh, fuck like I'm so far away from that <laughs> yeah and w- whatever whatever happens that's good it's like yeah whatever that happened you know it's good was good but what didn't work ah oh, this didn't work and we have to work on this Right, so yeah, but I I, I know that because I've, I've done it. So yeah. <laughs> and it's so depressing for people. It's so fucking depressing for people. I actually think that um, one needs to become very self-reflective and very you know being able to think <clears throat> on a on a meta level about what's happening when you become a CEO or a leader. You need to you have these two paths of thinking, like the what is happening right now and then observing from somewhere else yeah. what is happening. Yeah, and that's also a trap. I think right? you develop you can, that a lot as um, in the leadership position. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's also a trap, right? Because you can get caught up in, in that uh, in that uh, you know heightened uh, meta level, uh, yeah. <laughs> I like always call it the meta right? level. So, but mm-hmm. Like ju- just a, a dive into the meta level and, and being thoughtful for like just a bit, yeah. Uh, every day or <coughs> every week. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's super super important. But tell me then. Um, so you were speaking about the qualities of of the leader. Let's move to the qualities that you look for when you hire talent. So right now you're building this new organization. Mm. You're building a startup, and we know that you know the team is essential and critical for oh, yeah. the development of a startup. Oh, yeah. So what are the top qualities that you're looking for when you hire? It's a good question. Um, I think um, it's the, the first is about this ability to listen without, you know, uh, like really listen, like really process what someone is telling you because you want to look for information you're looking for things that could be useful for you Mm -hmm. right you're not and and i I have a bit of a problem with the whole empathy thing because i don't think this is about empathy it's just about being smart like i want (laughs) to listen to this person because i might find out something that's useful for me right and it's 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 just like a a very logical mechanism it's not an emotional mechanism (laughs) Right. So I think that that's one one of the things. And then it's about uh, ownership, right? And understanding that the only thing you can change in the universe, in the whole fucking universe, is how you. What's the input that you give to the to the rest of the world, right? You can say, oh, that person is wrong. That person is an asshole. That person is such a bad, right? And, and but that's not going to change anything. It's all about what you put out there in the world that's going to change that situation, right? So it's all about you. It's not about other people, right? And it's about understanding and thinking through well, what can I do different, right? So it's about how can this person be right? And then what can I do different in order to put the situation in, in you know, and drive it to some to an outcome that I would like, right? And that would p- potentially create value for, for, for both parties. But I, th- I think that's super important. I can totally relate to the point that you're actually making. It was such a revelation the moment that I felt that I need to change this kind of mindset. I, when I was younger, yeah. I was uh, one of, you know, I was, I tend to be one of the complainers. Like, um, I will be grumpy about this thing and the other thing and <clears> the <throat> other thing. And then at some point I caught myself and I was like, yeah, but actually I'm not taking any ownership and any accountability for the situation but, but it's so easy right yeah it's so easy and so sad because you don't have to do anything yeah. you're just relieving of a complete responsibility yeah. oh it's this guy's <laughs> problem it's not my problem i'm perfect it's this person's <laughs> problem. it's so easy and so easy to embrace yeah right and i think by the way there's like this wider narrative in in today's uh culture that that supports that and it seems so dangerous true, it's so true. dangerous because people stop 
thinking about what can I do different, right? Like then this whole discrimination thing. And, uh, you know, I, I went to the U.S. in, mm -hmm. in the, uh, what, at the beginning of, of Qualitans was 2011, 2012. And was I being discriminated against? Of course, right? Because I looked different. I spoke with an accent. I had like, you know, manners that were not, it's just like everything was Your different. Your pitch was about terrible. Me. And people were like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? <laughs> I, like, I don't like this guy. So what was my reaction? Like I could sit and come, oh, this is not right. I'm being discriminated against. Or, you know, what I geared myself up to is like, how can I create so much more value that these things don't matter, right? And then some people saw the, the value that we were creating and they were like excited about it and we started doing business. And But it's not about, you know, what's right. And again, right, what's right? Is this right? Yeah, actually it's right that I was being discriminated against because I was different, mm -hmm. right? And, and different can be a, a sign of, of danger, right? And that's very deeply ingrained in, in our, in our, you know, Rakidian kind of involvement, limbic system. So, uh, yeah, cool. I, I'm, and then so, the, the, yeah. the third thing, <coughs> and just to finish on, on this idea, like what are the things that we're looking for? We're definitely looking for <coughs> a bit of, um, intensity, like, uh, in, intensity to the point of, of, you know, almost kind of borderline insanity because, what we're doing and where we're headed is somewhere that's completely unreasonable, right? If you think about it, every startup wants to do something that's completely unreasonable. It's like, it's a small group of people. It's underfunded. It has no resources. It has probably no knowledge you know, or lacking knowledge. It doesn't have no knowledge. They, they have some knowledge, but it's lacking knowledge. And they're like, yeah, we're going to conquer the world or we're going to be like the biggest company in this space. We're going to we're going to fight off and beat much, much larger companies. Right. That's what every startup is saying. That's unreasonable. You have to hire unreasonable people in order to get unreasonable results. And you have to bring next to you in the journey people that are unreasonable and have a very high level of intensity. Right. You can't can't go on with people that are just reasonable and going to. You know, yeah, but you know, it's 6 p.m. and it's family time for me. So, yeah, balance. Yeah. I think that's complete bullshit. It that is. what you work <laughs> is who you are. But like you're defined by how you're contributing to society. Yeah, if you think work is just a way of getting money, that that's just so fucking wrong, right? Like you shouldn't work just to make money. That's prostitution, Can honestly, we? right? But um, um, and I said, you know, what, what, what you do and what you work and how you contribute to society is who you are. Like, and that's deeply ingrained in our, in our psyche, actually, right? If you look at how humanity has developed, right? Like people had a role in the tribe and that role was the defining uh, role for them, right? Like it was their identity was who they were. Mm. So I think how you contribute to the world is what defines you. So I don't think there's such a thing as work-life balance. That's the worst concept I've, I've ever heard. And you're making honest. work sound like a really ter terrible experience, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> like... I fucking love what I'm doing. Like I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't love it. And it's so satisfying, like going after complicated things with a team of great people. It's like the best feeling in the world, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, but I got so much hate for that, for that interview. Uh, <clears throat> Psychopath, yeah. sociopath. It's just, so I, I know this, I, 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 get, I will get I, so much hate on for, for this, but no, I, it's what I believe. I totally understand what you're saying. You have to be just a little bit nuts, you know, to do that. Yeah, no, it, again, unreasonable. So, so right. I guess it might be hard for you to imagine, but we were speaking about, you know, having a vision and, you know, wanted, wanting to, to go there. So I'm going to now move you to way uh, in the future. And I'm going to ask you for the final question. And the final question is, what do you want to be remembered for? Um, I don't know, my pretty face. <laughs> no clue, no. I, I, I hate that, that question because I... Uh, yeah, I, I'm not doing this for that. That's an ego question, mm -hmm. right? And I 
I, I don't care. I really don't care. I, I just... Do you want to be remembered? I, I don't want to be remembered as an asshole, for sure, right? That, that I don't want people saying, oh, he was a fucking asshole. Even though some people will, I mean, just check out Glassdoor. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's unavoidable, I think. And it's what I think Alan de Botton was, was saying that, you know, um, all the things in life that are valuable are worth imbalancing your life for. So I'm definitely not a balanced guy. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, that's not what I'm trying to be, like a balanced, well, well-rounded guy. I'm not that guy. I'm not, not trying to be that guy. So whenever you do something, there's going to be people who disagree with that. Whenever you stand up for something, there's going to be people who are going to disagree with you and who are going to dislike you. And that that's how it is. Like you can't, you know, if you want to, if you want everybody to like you, just don't do anything. Right, so I totally <clears throat> admire your courage. <laughs> so, uh, I, but I, I yeah, I, I think the only thing I, w I wouldn't, I would like not to be remembered as as an asshole. Okay, right? that's uh, that, that uh, is pretty much it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a low bar. It's a very low standard. Uh, this is actually a perfect answer. Yeah, I kind of really like it. <laughs> not being an asshole. So, Yuan. Thank you for well, thank you for this the invitation. very very honest conversation for you know being so open and so courageous also with your answers. I'm gonna get so much shit on yeah. on, on, on Might social be. media. You know, <laughs> Might unless be. You, you, you cut this properly. But so. you know we want to show the mindset of what it takes to be a startup founder, and I think this is part of it. I mean, not caring about people's opinion. Maybe who knows? <laughs> I mean, if you want to know what the mindset of a successful startup founder is you should ask Daniel Dines. Well we're still yeah we're still going to see of how things are going to develop with FlowX and I hope that you will keep us up to date at the recursive. Um, yeah I will. let's see how things develop. Sounds Thank you. Good. Thank you. In the next episode of the Recursive Podcast, Georgi talks to the designer turned entrepreneur Girgana Stancheva. She co-founded Lamon, a startup producing biodegradable laminating film for print and packaging. Because that's been, especially in the beginning, <laughs> that was a constant issue. We were always like, yeah, yeah, we'll be done in like a few more months and we'll be out on the market. And it's like, yeah, no, you're actually developing a new product. You need physical time to try things. <laughs> fail <laughs> and then try new things and fail some more and then, you know, figure out this actual product and how to do it. And if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere.